Good afternoon. Can everyone please be seated? Uh, my name is Michael Gottesman. I'm the Deputy Director for Intramural Research at the NIH. Uh, and welcome to the annual J. Edward Rawl uh, Cultural Lecture. This lecture honors the memory of J. Edward Rawl, founder of the Clinical Endoc Endocrinology Branch at the NIH, who with his colleagues and his longtime buddy Jake Robbins, made seminal contributions to thyroid physiology and pathophysiology, including the demonstration that treatment with iodine could block the toxic effects of radioiodine, I-131. Ed was the scientific director of the National Institute of Arthritis, Metabolism, and Digestive Diseases, uh, now known as NIDDK, and he was my predecessor as deputy director for intramural research. So why do we have a cultural lecture named after uh, a famous administrator and scientist? Ed was a true polymath, equally comfortable in the laboratory, in the clinic, acting as a global health diplomat or serving as a science administrator. He also was a consummate mentor and recruiter of fine talent to the NIH, including several who went on to win the Nobel Prize. Yet Ed was also a student of the arts and letters. It was he who recommended in 1984 that NIH add a cultural lecture to its director's series to expand the intellectual horizons of the staff at the NIH. Ed helped create the academic atmosphere of this NIH campus. As a result of Ed's passion for the arts, we have had for more than 30 years an incredibly exciting series of notable lectures. In just the past few years alone, we have hosted two extraordinary poets, Maya Angelou and Rita Dove, an esteemed theologian and philosopher, the Dalai Lama, and accomplished journalists, Tom Friedman and Sanjay Gupta. I would like to recognize Ed's family and his many friends who are in the audience, specifically his daughter, Pia Rawl, his son, Ed Rawl Jr., his sister-in-law, Gloria Rawl, um, and his many, many friends, and I noticed so many of them that I think I won't, I won't mention all their names. Um, today, we are thrilled to have another accomplished journalist and author, Ms. Diane Rehm, a native Washingtonian who began her radio career in 1973 as a volunteer producer for WAMU 88.5, the National Public Radio member station in Washington, D.C., in 1979, Ms. Reem began hosting WAMU's local morning talk show, Kaleidoscope, which was renamed The Diane Reem Show in 1984. The Diane Reem Show has since grown from a local program to one with international reach and a weekly on-air audience of more than 2.5 million, which exceeds Dr. Collins' tweet account. <laughs> in late December, Ms. Reem announced that she will be retiring from her radio program. Also this year, she is embarking on a book tour for her new memoir, On My Own. And for those of you who are interested, uh, she will be signing copies of her memoir on the FAS Terrace from 4.30 to 5 p.m. following the lecture. But today, Ms. Reem leaves the airways. We plan to turn the tables and have our director, Francis Collins, interview her. Dr. Collins is no stranger to the Diane Reem Show, having the opportunity to serve as a guest on the show on numerous occasions. I know he's been saving up a lot of questions for Ms. Reem, and we have some of your questions, too, submitted over the last two weeks. So please join me in welcoming our director, Francis Collins, and his guest, our special guest, Ms. Diane Reem. Thank you. Welcome, Diane. Thank you. It is a joy uh, to have you here at NIH. And you can see the hundreds of folks uh, that have turned up here and hundreds more who are watching remotely because this is being webcast to people who may be out there in the middle of an experiment or taking care of a patient or all the other things that go on in this amazing place. Thank you. I must say, it's been my great privilege to be on your show a few times. And as somebody who gets interviewed by other folks, there is no greater 
pleasure or privilege uh, than to sit in your studio and have you be the one who's asking the questions. And you always manage to have something come out of that conversation that I hadn't quite anticipated. So now I'm feeling a little pressure here because <laughs> Diane said she didn't want to give a lecture and uh, she would rather have a conversation. Right. And it seemed like that means, okay, I'm gonna have to step into the role that she would normally play, although I wouldn't be surprised if the tables get turned. <laughs> uh, as you heard, uh, we invited all of the folks here at NIH to send in questions uh, by email over the last few days. And uh, those have been received and sifted through, and I have a bunch of them. Good. And I might even add one or two of my own. Good. Nobody will able, be able to tell which is which. Good. Uh, and there's, there's a lot we could talk about, uh, because your career spans uh, many different phases of our nation and of your own interests. And now, uh, we, as we will come to, in a particular way, this book that you have written, the On My Own, which, again, you'll be able to sign for those who were interested in that at 4.30. We'll come to that, but I want to start uh, going back a little bit because you did not exactly have a traditional pathway towards becoming a journalist of such wide repute. In fact, I think if somebody had encountered you uh, working in the State Department uh, in a position which doesn't sound like it was particularly close to the media or even close to being in charge of anything, they might have not known exactly what path you were on. So how did this all start anyway? And, and maybe there are aspects of this that would relate to everybody who's trying to figure out what their career is, and maybe we all need to be clear about the fact there's no way to really know until huh. those doors open. So how do they open for you? Talk about that. Well, before I begin talking about that, I want to say how absolutely honored I am to have had you invite me to be here when I have invited you so many times, you and <laughs> Dr. Fauci and um, others here at yes. NIH, uh, the whole idea of being invited by you to be here today is cr really, truly an honor. Thank you. So I thank you. As to my early days, uh, as a professional, I began as a secretary at the D.C. Department of Highways. And my <laughs> boss, my boss was the director of the D.C. Department of Highways. And he would walk in in the morning, having driven in and seen all the potholes on the street, and he would say to me, Diane, get on the two-way and tell the workers where the potholes are. Boy, do we need that now. I mean. <laughs> and that's what I did. So that's how I started. I was then recruited to another job and then finally recruited to the Department of State where I was indeed a secretary. And um, one day a young man walked in there, a very brash young man with a crew cut and blonde hair and big shoulders. He had worked in his father's rock quarry, so he looked like a football player. But on my desk were three books that John Rehm always talked about, the Brothers Karamazov, the essays of Alfred North Whitehead, and uh, Somerset Maugham of Human Bondage. What were those books doing on your desk? <laughs> I was surrounded by intellectuals. Mm. I was surrounded by people at State Department, who had all been to college. I had never been to college. My mother and father did not believe in college for girls. And in all fairness, only about a third of our graduating class from high school went to college in those years. 1954, I graduated the year of Brown v. Board of Education. Mm. 
So I was expected to be a secretary and to bring home money for my mother and father. That's how I began. But those books were an indication that that was not your idea of what you wanted to have be your life pathway, apparently. I think that in beginning to talk with John about those books, uh -huh. John was truly a Renaissance man who taught me so much, not only about literature, but about music, about history, about science. There was literally no question I could ask him that he couldn't somehow mm -hmm. begin to talk about. He had had a fabulous education. His parents believed in education and so he became my teacher. Uh -huh. Then how did that lead into WAMU and radio, which doesn't sound like a natural next step either? What it's happened? Not. It? It's not. <laughs> I was at home for 14 years, caring for two wonderful children who are now grown and professionals in their own right. And at about 1973, I began to see the writing on the wall, which was, these kids are growing up. They're going to leave me. What am I going to do? Yeah. My husband had his own career. So I took a course at GW called New Horizons for mm -hmm. Women. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, everybody was separated by education. The PhD women were on the top floor. <laughs> the graduate degree women were on the next floor, and the bachelors on the first floor, and those of us with no education in the basement. <laughs> What a metaphor. You know how much I like that. <laughs> and I did protest. I have an assertive manner, if you did. <laughs> really? Um, <laughs> so I took that course, and there were about 20 of us. And for some reason, they all said to me, you know, you really ought to be in broadcasting. Well, it was the craziest thing I had ever heard huh. because though I had grown up with radio all my life, I had never thought about broadcasting. But within two weeks of finishing that course, a friend of mine said she was volunteering at this tiny little station on the campus of American University. It was in a little Quonset hut. <laughs> and when you went off the curb, you lost the signal. <laughs> <laughs> NPR was in its absolute infancy. You had probably never even heard of it back then. But when she told me that, honestly, Dr. Collins, if you could have seen me, you would have seen a little light bulb go on over <laughs> my head. And I thought, I'll go volunteer too. So I was accepted as a volunteer, and the first day I showed up, I was met by the manager of the station, and she said, you must be the new volunteer. Well, I have some sad news. The host is out sick. Well, I thought she was going to tell me to go back home. <laughs> Instead, she said to me, so I, the manager, am going to have to do the program, and I'd like you to come into the studio with me. First day. First day round table, microphones, and for 90 minutes, we interviewed a representative of the Dairy Council. <laughs> <laughs> now, I knew about butter 
and I knew about <laughs> milk, and I knew about cheese, so, and I knew they didn't belong at the top of the Department of Agriculture's healthy diet. Oh, okay. So I challenged that person. As I said, I'm not shocked. <laughs> it started there. That's it started where it there. Uh -huh. It started there. That's and that was day one. That was day one. And pretty soon, how long before they said, Diane, uh, maybe it's your show now and not something you're helping with? Well, the only person who said that on the first day was John Rain. <laughs> I went home and I was so excited having had this opportunity and John Ream looked at me and said, someday you're going to be host of that show. Uh, he had such faith in me uh, that I could do this. So I was a volunteer for 10 months, then uh, somebody left, I got the uh, part-time job as producer, stayed on for two years and went off to do some television, and then became a medical reporter for the Associated Press Radio Network. Mm -hmm. You didn't know that's why I was so interested in you all, did you? I was going to get there, but now you're giving me a tip here. Yeah, so, uh, exactly. So for two years, I did that, and then my boss went to retire. She called and let me know she was going to retire. And John and I thought about it because it was exactly the same pay for a full day and a full program and a full week that I was getting paid for three days a week. So I thought about it, but then I thought, you know, I've been focused on medicine, and now I want to move into the broader world. And so I took the job. Uh, I applied for it with a hundred other people, and I was lucky enough to get it. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, that's even harder than getting an NIH grant. Really? <laughs> One percent success rate. Think about that. Well, and then, of course, uh, you acquired a remarkably dedicated audience who mm. wanted uh, to be able to hear what you were drawing out of a wide variety of people. And certainly, all of us being a little biased, are uh, particularly impressed by the focus that you've had in medical research on your program. Um, is that something that you specifically try to emphasize, or it's just it's the most interesting stuff anyway? That it is, <laughs> but my mother died when I was 19 of liver cancer. Mm. My father died 11 months later, literally of a broken heart. Mm. Mm. Um, I wanted to know why, and there were no answers. Mm. She was not a drinker. He was not a drinker, but he had a bad heart. Mm. And when she died, he literally did not want to live mm. any longer. Mm. Then John's father got diabetes, which turned into diabetic retinopathy. He took his own life. Then his mother, several years later, at 92, feeling as though she could no longer function or walk, took her own life. Wow. So death and illness and medicine has always been something that I have had great interest in. And you have, by bringing researchers into your studio, opened all kinds of topics for the public that might otherwise not have come to their attention. Absolutely. But I don't imagine that's always easy. You have here a, a whole bunch of folks who may be future interviewees on a medical research program. You never know. <laughs> So when you uh, go through one of these uh, hour-long interviews, there must be times where you say to yourself, 
wow, that was just so perfect. And other times where you're like, oh, I thought we'd never get to the end. So, so give, give some pointers. For somebody who wants to describe their research to the public in a program like yours, how can they do it better? By being concise, mm -hmm. by knowing their subject so well that it comes out not as a scientist talking to a scientist, but rather a scientist who knows her or his subject so well that it's conversational. Mm -hmm. That is the kind of message that really reaches people. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. when uh, Dr. Fauci has talked about the Zika virus or AIDS, as he mm -hmm. did so many times, when you come on to talk about the genetic structure of the human body, I mean, mm -hmm. people are fascinated. Mm -hmm. They really want to know, but it's because those of you who have come on the program, and I see Dr. Katz, Dr. Katz has come on the program <laughs> yes, yes. to talk about his subject. I mean, when that happens and people can put it into natural, conversational terms, mm -hmm. that's when it works. You must have experiences also where because of the role you play, you're supposed to stay objective and uh, sort of above the fray, and yet there must be times where you have somebody on your show where you think to yourself, what they're saying is really a bunch of bunk, but you can't exactly phrase it that way. How do you maintain that sort of cool objectivity without occasionally telling some guests that you're really not saying anything that anybody should pay attention to? How do you deal with that? <laughs> I think I'll tell you about the worst experience I've ever had on the air. Go for it. Yeah. I hope it doesn't involve me. No. <laughs> um, there was an author who came in early on in his career, and he had a huge bestseller. Huge. I mean, and went on to millions and millions of copies. And he had on his dark glasses when he walked in. And I thought he was going to take them off, but instead he put his hand up on the table <laughs> like that. He wouldn't even look at me. I had read his book absolutely thoroughly, and so I was prepared to ask a good question. First answer out of his mouth, yep. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> so I rolled up another question. Second answer, nope. <laughs> and I'm looking at the clock. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I've got two choices. I am in control. Mm -hmm. I have two choices. I can either say to this fellow, you know, it's clear you'd rather not be here. Why don't you just leave? <laughs> and I'll open the phones because I'm sure there are a lot of people in the audience who'd like to have a conversation, and I can just open the phones. Or maybe he's got some problem with me or women or something, so I'll just open the phones and maybe he'd rather talk with callers. First caller, a man who begins by saying, I love your book, but I have to tell you, you sure are being arrogant with our Diane. <laughs> <laughs> At which point, the guy on the, uh, the, the guest says, he 
takes off his glasses, throws them on the table, and says, oh, no, we're having a wonderful time, aren't we, Diane? <laughs> and the guy on the phone says, it sure doesn't sound that way to us. <laughs> and from that time on, he's a pussycat. All right. So, you know, you've got ways to deal with things. That's awesome. So call-in saved you at least that time, or saved the guest. But I bet sometimes the call-ins drive you nuts because <laughs> they come on pretty strong. I know you have a filter where you try to be sure that somebody who's calling in is not a total wacko before they actually get on the air, but the okay. filter doesn't always seem to work. <laughs> so, uh, Well, here's what I have for those who are listening, when somebody's going on and on and on, and I realize that they have asked the question in the first five words, <laughs> I had something called a fader button. <laughs> so I just slide that little button right down <laughs> and turn the question over to the guest. And that's how we Just deal with slide. it. Boy, I could use that in some meetings. Maybe we could <laughs> have that installed. I'll already. bet you could. <laughs> Diane, you've had your own medical challenge, and one that, in a unique way, must have been particularly difficult for somebody who's a radio voice, and yet you were afflicted by this rare condition, this spasmodic dysphonia, and spasmodic had, to, dysphonia. had to deal with that. Can you say a little bit about what that experience was like and what was the medical care system that you encountered offering you? How did that part go? I was uh, from 1992 until 1998. I felt my voice clutching, clamping. Mm -hmm. And it started with a cough. A tiny little cough. <laughs> and then the cough became so repetitive that Barbara Mikulski, the senator from Maryland, came in one day and I couldn't do the show. Ooh. And I had tears in my eyes and she said, now listen, if you need help, I'll get you to NIH. Well, <laughs> Barbara Mikulski can do yeah. that. And I she guess. will be here next Monday, and maybe she'll tell this story too. <laughs> okay, okay. So I went from doctor to doctor to doctor, all of whom kept putting tubes down my throat. Mm -hmm. I think the insertion of those tubes did not help mm. my condition. Mm. The last doctor who did that said, okay, I'm putting a camera on the end of this tube, and I am going to see what's going on with your vocal cords. My husband came, my dear friend came with me. He sort of put me into a drowsy state because I cannot stand having those tubes put down my throat. It's very difficult. Um, the doctor called me the next day and said, sorry, the camera didn't work. <laughs> Not good. I mean, I let fly. <laughs> I really did. So the last day I was on the air was February 1998. And I was on the air for two hours and I I don't want to frighten you, but this is how I sounded. I could barely get a word out. That's how I sounded. Oh. So I left the studio very quickly. I had to go downtown to the Four Seasons to moderate a panel discussion. And I left there as quickly as I could, having said almost nothing to moderate. Mm -hmm. I just let them do it. Mm -hmm. And I went right back to my studio, to my boss, and I said, I'm out of here. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I can't talk. I have to 
find out what's wrong with mm. my voice. Mm. Four months, I sat at home. I sat at home, not answering a phone, not speaking to anyone except my husband. Wouldn't go to the door, wouldn't go out of the house for fear of having to speak with someone. And finally, my wonderful internist, Carol Horn, called and said, we have to get you to Johns Hopkins. We have to find out what's going on. Within one hour, Dr. Stephen Rich, the same neurologist who had diagnosed my husband with Parkinson's, and Dr. Paul Flint, otolaryngologist, said, you have spasmodic dysphonia. They gave me the first injection of Botox into my vocal cords, which, as you know, paralyzes them so they don't come together for a little while. And then slowly, slowly, they begin to vibrate and I can speak again. I am almost now at the point where I need another injection, which I have every four months. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Dr. Flint has now moved out to Oregon Health Sciences University and I don't trust anybody else <laughs> to do it. So I go out there every oh, four months. My gosh. So you came back then to your show after this hiatus and um, started right up. And started writing yeah. because someone from Slate called me and said, would you keep a diary? of what's happening uh -huh. to you during this process. Uh -huh. And I remember it was the first Mother's Day that I went to church and could not sing. It was a very powerful memory. Yeah. Well, hallelujah that this uh, opportunity for turning this around got discovered and Indeed. that you continue Indeed. to be the voice that so many of us immediately recognize and feel our hearts warmed uh, when we turn on the radio Thank and, oh, it's Diane, we know it's going to be an interesting hour. Thank you. So uh, that was a wonderful outcome. You know, just now, <clears throat> you have been willing in telling stories here and in your books to be very personal. I want to come up uh, to the most recent book you've written, uh, an intensely personal book, uh, which describes in, at times, wrenching uh, ways and details uh, the death of your husband, who, as you've already mentioned, uh, had long-standing Parkinson's disease uh, and who, over the course of time, uh, lost more and more of his abilities uh, to function. Uh, those of you who have not had a chance uh, to read through this book, I would certainly suggest that you do so and that you, you see, as you're doing it, an intimate portrait of someone describing uh, the loss of their life's partner in an unflinching way, but also a way that uh, carries a lesson uh, for all of us about whether we as a nation are approaching the end of life issues in a way that is respectful of the wishes of those who are facing that. So Diane, say a bit uh, about, again, intensely personal, and I appreciate your doing so in, a, in an audience of this sort. What what happened there? Uh, what was that all about? What, what should have happened that didn't? What could we as people involved in medicine learn from this experience that you tell so personally? And what should we as a nation think about doing that we're currently not that mm -hmm. good at? Um, at the end, um, John Rain could no longer use his hands. He could no longer feed himself. He could no longer stand. He could no longer walk from his bed at an assisted living facility to the bathroom. He could no longer care for himself in any way. So he asked our daughter, 
who is also a physician in Boston, to be on the phone. He asked our son to come down from Gettysburg, where he was provost at Mount St. Mary's University. He asked his doctor at the facility to be there and for me to be there. And when we had all gathered, he said, I am ready to die. I am ready to die. And I want you, Dr. Freed, his physician, there to help me. And Dr. Freed said very simply, I absolutely uh, understand your wish, but legally, morally, ethically, I cannot help you. We are here in the state of Maryland, which does not and has not yet passed a law for the right to die. My husband became very upset. Dr. Freed then said, only you can make this happen if you are absolutely determined by virtue of eliminating food, medication, and water. And as I'm sure most of you know, we can go an awfully long time without food, but without water, the organs begin to break down very quickly. We all left that day not knowing what John's decision was going to be, but I came in the next day with a photograph album I had made for him of his life, beginning with his childhood in Paris. His father was sports editor of the Paris Herald Trib. His mother was a Paris runway model. So John was born and lived in Paris for the first six years. And his life came here knowing no English and speaking only perfect French so that I sat on his bed with him looking at this beautiful album, and he turned to me, he looked so well that day, he turned to me and said, I have had nothing to eat, I have had nothing to drink, I have had no medication, and I feel great. And I know why he felt great. He felt as though he had taken his life back into his own hands. Mm -hmm. And I said, sweetheart, are you sure that this is what you want? And he said, absolutely. Now, John and I, because of all those deaths, that we had experienced from early on, had talked a great deal about what we wanted at the end of life. And he and I had both promised each other that we would help each other die when the time came. I thought because he was six years older, because his mother had lived till 92, I thought he had longevity, but nobody ever counts on Parkinson's disease. No, they don't. So for the next two days, he was fine. His face looked pink. He looked wonderful. And then at the end of the second day, he fell asleep, and he never woke again. Um, the doctor, it was interesting, the doctor had warned us when we first entered that assisted living facility a year and a half earlier. 
He said, Diane, you are a public figure. Please, please do not do anything to make John's life end. Because he knew we had talked about it. So I promised I would do nothing. But I'll tell you, the temptation was certainly there to end what I saw as this man's lying there for 10 days. Absolutely helpless. And what for? What for? I ask all of you whether you have talked with your families about what it is you want. Have you talked with your parents? Have you talked with your children? Have you talked with your friends? I've been traveling around the country on this book, and do you know that in St. Louis, there is now a group called Coffee and Death. And they are friends and neighbors who gathered to talk about exactly what it is they want. So everybody in their neighborhood, not just their immediate family, not just their lawyers, but their neighbors know what it is they want. I think up to now, this country has been death averse mm. until Oregon passed its law, then Washington State passed its law, Vermont followed. Now you have California. And I'll give you just a brief encapsulation of Governor Jerry Brown's last paragraph of his signing statement. He said, he wrote, I do not know what I will want when the time comes. What I am absolutely certain of is that I would not want someone else to make that decision for me. So I know that what we have to do is to talk more openly. If you believe that God will take you when your time comes, I totally support that belief. If you believe that what you want at the end of your life is endless palliative care that never ends until you go, I support that 100%. But if what you want is to go as I want to go when my time feels no longer of use. I support you in that mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. I think there is so much to talk about and so much for doctors to learn mm -hmm. about listening to that patient about what that patient wants and how best you can help make that happen. It seems to me, and certainly I've heard this from my daughter and my son-in-law, who is also a doctor, we are trained to heal. We are trained to keep people going. But if that next chemotherapy, if that next radiation treatment is simply going to grant another month, and that month 
will cause as much suffering as it will healing. Is it really, really what you as doctors want to keep doing? Certainly that's a question that those who work here in our clinical center wrestle with. Because people come to NIH as sort of their last hope. I am you say. They are often here because the standard medical treatments have run out of promise and maybe there's some experimental approach that will help. And we all are thrilled when that works. But because it is experimental, oftentimes it does not. And the docs who are here in this room wrestle every day with what is the right thing to then say to a patient where there are no more options and yet you don't want to convey a sense that you've stopped caring. You actually are caring even more of course. about trying to help with a topic that, as you've said, our culture is not very good at dealing with. But in medical school, how many doctors are taught with how to reach that patient who may be hopeless mm -hmm. and to say, you know, perhaps nothing more will help, rather than let's try this yeah. or let's try that. I think more than used to be, uh, but again, exactly. as you've said, we doctors are taught and motivated to try to achieve healing, it is hard, it's hard to say that we have run out of options. But as I said a minute ago, that's probably the greatest and most significant calling a doctor has is when you don't have options and you still have to maintain that relationship, that caring, that playing the role of trying to help somebody move through that next door, even if that next door is the end of their life. One of the people about whom I've written in the book is my dear friend Roger Mudd, mm. the former CBS, NBC, PBS NewsHour anchor, whose wife woke up one morning and said, I think I'm having a heart attack. They got her to a hospital within minutes immediately intubated her, fixed her with all kinds of tubes. For three weeks, mm. she was that way. Mm. She could not write. She was a beautiful writer. She could not even write on a blackboard to try to communicate. And finally, finally, the doctor came in and said to the entire family, there's nothing more I can do. Mm. So they had the option of leaving her as she was on life support because they are serious Roman Catholics mm -hmm. or making that decision to end it which they all agreed was the kindest, most loving thing that they could do. And a terribly difficult decision a for families to make. A very difficult decision. So, Diane, I think the Washington Post uh, comments based upon your book that you've become a prominent voice uh, in this very complex, wrenching topic about the right to die. Is that something you embrace? Is that something you expect you will be putting a lot of your time into? Because I guess we are all grieving about the fact that you've announced that this is your last year uh, on the Diane Rehm show. Will this be the place that your considerable energies uh, move into, along with maybe other things? It will be one of the places. The Washington Post got me into a lot of trouble by calling me an advocate. I didn't think of myself <laughs> as an advocate. I just thought of myself as somebody who talks a lot <laughs> um, and, and felt as though I was free to talk about the right to die. Mm -hmm. um, I will be 
talking a great deal mm -hmm. about the right to die. Yes. I also am going to be speaking out a great deal about Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and Parkinson's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will continue to appear in a play around the country called um, Surviving Grace about Trish Bradenberg's Trish Braden's mother yes. who fell into Alzheimer's. We've done a reading of that play here in Washington, in Hollywood, in San Diego, in Boston, in North Carolina. We'll continue to do that. I play the mother who falls into wow. Alzheimer's. So it's quite a powerful experience sure. for me. I'm sure. But I will speak out wherever I am asked on what I believe is the right to die without necessarily crossing any lines. If I am, after I leave the microphone, as I have already been and had to refuse, asked to appear before a state legislature or whatever, I will do so mm. after yeah. I step away from the microphone. And why did you decide uh, to step away? Your program is just so well received, so many of us are addicted to you. Uh, why is this the right time? Because you still want me to stay. <laughs> ah, because I am 79 in September. I will be 80 years old. It struck me that 80 was a good time to make a change. <laughs> so I... I really feel strongly that NPR, public radio, needs to welcome in a variety of voices. Mm -hmm. I've had that real estate, that 10 to noon real estate, so valuable mm -hmm. at NPR for 37 years. Wow. Two hours a day, 37 years. Amazing. Dr. Collins, don't you think that's enough? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm glad, though, that you're not going to depart before you help us all get through the circus called the 2016 presidential the campaign. The most <laughs> wacko campaign I have ever seen. Now, Truly. And is that fun to sort of preside over the, the voices that walk into your studio and try to make sense out of this? Oh, the, the people who come into my studio are totally reasonable, yeah. or else they wouldn't be there. You wouldn't invite That's them. That's right. Okay. It is the ones who are on the presidential stage that I'm having a really hard time with. <laughs> Yeah, I probably shouldn't say too much at this point, but I think we all know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and we all hope that somehow uh, Churchill will be right when he said the Americans always do the right thing after they've exhausted all the other options. Exactly. That's a great, great comment. I love it. I love it. Well, Diane, you have uh, shared with us wonderfully uh, in ways about your career uh, about the way in which you've given us advice uh, about how we can be better at what we do in terms of explaining our work to the public. All of us feel passionate about it and want everybody else to experience that, and sometimes we're good at that and sometimes we're not, so your, your pointers are well taken. And you've been very personal as well, and you've shared with us uh, some things that are quite intimate and quite wrenching and force all of us to think about things that most of the time, uh, we go through our daily experience and don't pay a lot of attention. We'd rather to. not. We'd rather not, but we need to do that. And you're an important voice in many ways, but in this way, maybe right now especially, uh, to convince us that that denial is probably not uh, the best solution in the long term if it's something as important uh, as end-of-life issues. I think Brittany Maynard and her voice mm. stood out so strongly, that courageous young woman with 
clearly terminal brain cancer, mm -hmm. who moved mm -hmm. from California to Oregon to be able to take advantage yeah. of their death with dignity And law. carried through with that. And carried through with that. With her family around her. With her family around her, my goodness gracious. Mm -hmm. And to know that, to feel that California becomes the tipping point. Mm. And I do believe other states will follow. I hope that is the case. So all of you who are interested in the possibility of having a meet and greet uh, with Diane at 4.30 in the terrace uh, next to the FAS bookshore, bookstore, that will be happening uh, with this book being the one uh, primarily of interest. But you might bring others that she's written as well. I just want to conclude by reading the citation that was presented to Diane by President Obama on July 28, 2014, shortly after her husband's death. And it certainly captures, uh, in the words of this citation, for the National Humanities Medal, something that I have personally felt, and I suspect many of you as well, uh, in terms of, of what her contributions have meant to us says the following, to Diane Rehm, for illuminating the people and stories behind the headlines in probing interviews from everyone, from pundits to poets to presidents. Ms. Rehm's keen insights and boundless curiosity have deepened our understanding of our culture and ourselves. You have indeed. Thank you for being with us oh, this afternoon. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.